Yep. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's so lovely to see you all over here this morning and practicing together in our song. We've just finished a seven day, uh, what we call Rohatsu retreat. Uh, and um, today is uh, December 8th, which is the day the Buddha was enlightened. So we celebrate Buddha's enlightenment uh, today. So I thought it would be appropriate to talk about Buddha's enlightenment. Uh, the best, I can't think of a better way to do it than to appreciate uh, the Genjo poem by Dogen. So this is my last uh, Taisho or Dharma talk for 2019 and the last talk I'm giving for the decade. So I spent most of this decade building a curriculum around mindfulness. We have a wonderful Zen center that is secular and friendly and uh, accessible to people. So I haven't talked about Dogen for about 10 years. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he's very Zen and uh, he's a very religious man, which is a religious text. So, uh, and he's a 13th century monastic, so I'm not suggesting that we all go back and practice like Dogen, but I am going to recommend that you really take to heart this teaching of the Genjo Koan, because it doesn't get much better than this when it comes to spiritual truths and the, really the authentic teaching of Buddhism and Zen. So I also want to give a big shout out to David Brazier and his new translation of the Genjo Koan called uh, The Dark Side of the Mirror, which I'm going to be using for this talk. So I used to talk about Dogen when we were more religious and um, <laughs> practicing in a different way. We probably had eight people in our song. <laughs> Um, but I always found, I've read different translations, I've always been partial to my Zumiroshi's translation because I grew up listening to my teacher talk about Genjo Koan. And my Zumiroshi could spend the whole talk just talking about the title of Genjo Koan. And he was always talking about uh, Dogen. And uh, there's a joke that uh, my Zumiroshi met Katagiri Roshi at uh, Zen Sushi, which is a silver temple in LA a long time ago. And, and my Zumi Roshi said, Katagiri Roshi, how come you're always talking about Dogen? And Katagiri Roshi said, oh, I don't always talk about Dogen. And they continue the conversation about five minutes later. So Katagiri Roshi says, but Dogen said. So I have always, and I've read a lot of different translations of the Genjo Koan, and I've always found parts of it to be okay, I have to admit. I always pretended like I understood them because I'm supposed to be a Zen teacher, but I really didn't. And I found, uh, the, I, I thought it was a collection, a loose collection of profound teachings which I really couldn't quite grasp. And with this translation that David has done, uh, it's now clear to me that this is one teaching, it's, um, one, it's one piece of cloth all the way through, and it's very, he meant it to be clear, he wasn't trying to be obscure. The problems of translating the Gen Genjo Koan are considerable, <coughs> and uh, I think David Brazier has solved a lot of the problems that exist, uh, that are in existing translations. So I was, I'm just enormously grateful that I was able to sit with this uh, text during the, our retreat and give talks on it and that I can share it with you today. And it's easy to get lost on any line in the Genjo Koan, so I'm not going to go line by line. I want to give you an overview and, and a context and we need to kind of put our mind into the mindset of a 13th century monastic. So. First thing to appreciate, appreciate about Dogen was he had, a, he had a really tragic life early on. He lost his father when he was two. Uh, he lost his mother when he was eight. And uh, as he was watching the incense smoke over the casket of his mother, he vowed he would ordain as a, as a monk, as a Buddhist monk. And he did when he turned 13. 
he ordained as a monk. He went to the Kentai, uh, uh, I'm not sure I'm getting the name right, uh, you can, uh, Kentai Monastery, it had a name which I, I'm not going to bother to look up here, but you can find it. it. It was the capital of Japan at the time. It was where almost everyone went that was anybody that wanted to study Zen. And it was a, it was not sectarian. There were people doing different practices there, Nambutsu, chanting the names of Buddha, Zen, uh, other forms of Buddhist practice, pure land. And the thing that bothered, uh, Dogen had to be a really impressionable, like, not unlike Shakyamuni Buddha, impressionable young man and a serious person, a serious intellect, and he was bothered. And at, the, at that time, one of the main teachings was uh, the teaching of original enlightenment, or what we call uh, Tathagata Garbha, the womb of the Buddha, Buddha nature. And this was a teaching that arose with Mahayana Sutras as they were translated in, from India to China. And it was carried through, and the idea was that we all have the seed of, we are all inherently intrinsically awake. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? <laughs> but what bothered Dogen about this teaching was, and it, it was what was being taught at the time, at this time was, uh, by many, was that because we are uh, intrinsically awake, we really don't need to practice. What's the point of practicing if you're intrinsically awake? You know, just, just get it that you're awake. <laughs> Easier said than done. But. So Dogen was bothered by the inconsistency because Dogen intuitively felt that practice was really important. So he stayed at that monastery for four years and then he left and he went to study with his teacher Myozen at another monastery, I think it was Kenenji or something. Um, and uh, Isai had, uh, was a contemporary of Dogen's who had passed away, had gone to uh, China and come twice. And the, uh, the first time, uh, the second time he went to China, he, on his way back to Japan, the boat got waylaid in a storm and went back to the shore of China. So he stayed in China for a couple more years. He was one of those happy accidents because he picked up a lot of Rinzai teachings and then brought them back to Japan. And so Miozen decided he wanted to do the same thing, and, and Dogen jumped at the chance to go to China. Because you have to understand, China was, you know, like we think of Greek as being the golden age, and everyone refers back to Greece and European culture. The Japanese referred back to China as the golden age. Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> Dogen was you know, dissatisfied with the, the teachings he was hearing in Japan. He just wanted to go find something there. So he, he, he went with his teacher. They got to China and they, they it was Rujing's monastery. Again, I forget, I'm sorry I'm not a scholar. I forget some of the names, but you can find the history. It's all available. You can find it in David's book, in fact. Um, and Myozen was accepted to the monastery, but Dogen wasn't, because there was some technical glitch in how he had received the precepts in Japan and they didn't acknowledge it in China. So you can imagine, here's this really uh, sincere, earnest, young uh, Zen practitioner has gone all the way to China with his teacher and they don't accept him into the monastery. So he has to apply to get accepted. And it's a long process, just the application. So he's hanging out in the, the local town, not able to go into the monastery waiting for his application to be processed and approved, and he waits a long time, and when it comes through, it's not approved. So he can't go to the monastery. So he wanders around, and then uh, a couple years after they get there, Myozen dies. So uh, Dogen's left on his own. He's kind of humiliated and, and goes looking for other teachers, uh, the real teacher that he's looking for. He can't find him anymore. What he finds is teachers that are complacent, and talking in cliches and really not satisfying to him intellectually. He can't find anybody. So he's really down and out. He's despairing. And, and uh, he says, I'm just, okay, I, this is it. I can't get it here. I'm going to go back to Japan. He 
you're getting ready to go back to Japan, and he hears that Ruching has a new, there's a new abbot at this monastery where he had first gone, Ruching, and he decides he'll try to go there once more and see if he can get in with the new abbot. And he goes, and Ruching accepts him, takes uh, sympathy on him, sees the, the, the quality of, of who he is and his aspiration, and he accepts him into the monastery. But he's still not allowed to gather with the monks, with any gatherings. He has to stay with the outsiders, the Taoists and the lay people. Can you imagine the humiliation? He's, he's actually got a lot of seniority over the, the younger monks in the monastery where he's practicing, but he's really put down and, and almost classified as a lay person. So his experience in China was one of a lot of difficulties and discouragement. And then there's a, a point where he's in the monastery, he's sitting in the zendo, and like we sit here, and there's a monk falling asleep, and uh, Rujin comes up and reprimands the monk, and says, how can you sit here, just drop off body and mind? And when Dogen hears that phrase, he has a great uh, satori, kensho enlightenment experience, great uh, opening. And uh, he um, stays another year studying with Rujin, um, I think he received transmission from Ruching, and he comes back to Japan really enthusiastic about the Buddha Dharma and wanting to teach now uh, what he has discovered. And within, I think, just, I think he writes the Bendoa first, and then the, the Genjo Koan comes next. And you have to understand, this, this amazing, deep, profound uh, spiritual text of the Genjo Koan, he wrote as a letter to a lay practitioner. We don't know what the lay practitioner asked him. The lay practitioner had asked him something in a letter or, or by word of mouth, and in response, Dogen writes this text to that lay practitioner. And we have to assume that he's writing a text that that lay practitioner could understand. He wasn't trying to be esoteric. And so, it's a little puzzling that we don't get it in the same way. <laughs> <He's at least. laughs> but I don't I think Dogen was teach saying one thing, it was one piece of thought, and when you get the way we could uh, consider this translation, it all comes together in a, in a beautiful, this is a, just an amazing and beautiful teaching. And I think part of the key here. And David Brazier takes some liberties here. He always has. He wrote a book called The Feeling Buddha where he took liberties talking about the Four Noble Truths. But then so did Bernie. He called them the Four Opinions. <laughs> <laughs> but David says, and I, he says, you know, you have to appreciate that Dogen was steeped in Chinese culture, Chinese thought. And Chinese culture was Taoism and Confucianism. Those were the, they speak about the three legs, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Con Confucianism. And I, I looked for references to Chinese stuff around Dogen. I couldn't find any. And I, when I looked at translations and commentaries, I didn't find anyone talking about Taoism or Confucianism. And all I could find was one thing that Dogen said. He said this idea of the three religions is stupid. So definitely Dogen would not consider himself a Taoist or a Confucian. He was clearly a Buddhist. But you have to understand, just like in our culture, we're steeped in a secular, scientific, humanistic psychology. It's just part of our, it's how we have assumptions that we have based on the culture we live in, that we don't think about. And it's the same way for Dogen. He, he, was, he, he was soaked in these teachings about Taoism and Confucianism. So when he writes this text, he's writing it with, he's not writing as a Taoist or a Confucian, but those teachings which he, uh, in Chinese culture, which he values, he's bringing into the into the text, especially uh, both Taoism and Confucianism. And when you look at the text from that point of view, it all starts to come together in a most amazing and beautiful way. So if 
far so good. <laughs> Question? Does that mean that we have to understand some things about God and Confucianism? Yeah, yeah, we can do it. Sorry. <laughs> So the, the central teaching that it, it is go, runs throughout the whole teaching is in the center of the text. It talks about being a mirror, the mirror, and the dark side of the mirror. And this uh, always puzzled me, this, this teaching. It was something about non-duality or not being separated. I never really understood it. But when you look at it from the point of view of Taoism, it makes so much sense. Let me read the line so we're just uh, to make sure for sure we're there. Uh, though one may deeply understand the forms of body and mind, though one may deeply understand what body and mind are saying, still this is not a reflection in a mirror, nor like the moon in the water, which is only realized on one side when the other side is dark. This is the crux of the whole Genjo Koan. And what Dogen is saying here is that, you know, like a, um, if you were looking at water and it's, you can see the bottom of the pond through the water and the water is transparent and that's beautiful. And then at some point, the under side, in the, the water becomes darker, and at some point it tips and becomes a mirror, right? You see the reflection in the water. That tipping point is, is instant. It doesn't happen gradually. It's either a mirror or it's not. You're either seeing through the water or the water is reflecting whatever is, it becomes a mirror. And a, and a mirror is essentially is, a, is just a piece of glass that one side is painted black. That's what makes it a mirror. It's, it has to have the black on one side to reflect what's on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. so, are you with me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dogen is using this as a metaphor. And what he's saying essentially is to drop off the body of mind, which was the phrase he heard that it, where he was enlightened, he had Satori, when he heard this. Being on the dark side of the mirror is dropping off the body and mind. What that means is to forget the self. Not so easy to forget the self. Mm -hmm. We're pretty attached to it. But that's a uh, basic teaching of Buddhism, is that the ego that we have had, we're appropriating the Dharma for our own purposes. John Parvishe called that spiritual materialism. So what Dogen is saying here is the Buddha, and he, He's, he's consistent throughout. He's criticizing this notion that we possess Buddha nature. How can you possess enlightenment or Buddha nature? Dogen uses the word Buddha Tao. When we say Buddha way, it sounds like it's something about Buddhism. But we're, that word way is just a translation of Tao. That's an English translation of the Chinese character, Tao. So if you said Buddha Tao, it has a much different implication, and it actually has a more dynamic sense of the Chinese uh, thought that is encompassed when we say Buddha Tao. So in, in Chinese thought, there's a notion of yin and yang, and it's very dialectical. The yin and yang are in balance, and you're on one side or the other, and if you go really far aside on the yin, which is the feminine receiving side, you can flip to the yang side, which is the male, male side. What Dogen is saying is to be the dark side of the mirror is how you become a mirror to reflect the Buddha Dharma. And here, what, we mean, what he means by Dharma is what is other than you. He 
he's not saying, it's not so important that you possess the Dharma or the Buddha nature or anything. What's more important is that you can see it and reflect it. And you know, what Dogen is saying that in order to reflect this sacred Buddha, the most sacred word in Buddhism is Dharma. It has many meanings. But essentially it means, from Dogen's point of view, Dharma is anything other than you or me. It's other. And because it's other, I can't mess with it. I can't create it. I can't destroy it. It's why we call it the unborn. It's unborn because it's unconditioned. Everything that I do is conditioned. I'm creating karma all the time. I'm creating and destroying things. I'm appro trying to appropriate the Dharma for my own ends. And what Dogen is saying is, that's not the, that's not the Buddha Dharma. The Buddha Dharma, when you are, when you awake, awakening is being able to be the mirror that reflects the Buddha Dharma. And the only way you can be that mirror is to forget the self, to be self-effacing, to be humble, to be on the yin side of the mirror, which is the dark side. That's the yin side, the receptive side. You know, our culture really emphasizes the yang side, and things usually go wrong on the yang side. We, when we're on the yang side, we tend to get carried away, and we overdo things. That's what happens on the yang side. And the, it's a basic principle of Taoism uh, that you should try to be on the yin side as much as possible. Because when you're on the yin side, you can see the yang side. But when you're on the yang side, you really don't see the yin side because you're kind of full of yourself. So the idea is, yeah, we have to be on the yang side to function in the world and do things. But as soon as you're done doing something on the yang side, you should return to the yin side as soon as possible. And Dogen is saying, and this is why if you miss the, the, the Taoist element in his thinking here, you'll miss the, the, the real meaning of the Genjo Kong. He's saying that to wake up, to be enlightened, to be liberated, is to be able to be this mirror that reflects other, reflects Buddha Dharma as it is, without projecting into it. We're always projecting. But the idea of dropping body as mind is that we could actually forget the self. The self is not that important. It, in fact, if you, <coughs> Dogen in one passage says, you know, to study Buddhism is to study the self. And I think he's making a very plain statement here. To study Buddhism is to study your human nature, what it's like to be a human being. Empirically, look at it. What, it, what do you do? And then if you, if you study the self and you become familiar with the self, you'll find it's not as interesting as you thought. <laughs> In fact, it's kind of tedious and tiresome. And so that's what Dogen's saying is get over yourself and get on with living, uh, being liberated and being free of the, the karma that's created by ourself. That's a teaching of Buddhism. So this is a central metaphor. And everything that he does, he's building his argument around this metaphor of this mirror that reflects the Buddha Dharma. And to be on the dark side, you have to you have to be on the yin, in the yin experience, so to speak. And he, so you might have questions. Maybe we just talk have a little any discussion of questions about this. Uh, this is important to get this point before we go any further. Yes. Something came up for me as you described two sides of the mirror and reflection, you mentioned reflection in water, seeing through water, reflection on water. Yeah. And oh, something came up about a tipping point. Mm -hmm. what the tipping point is, this happens, uh, the water is either transparent or it's a mirror. It doesn't gradually become a mirror. It's either a mirror or it isn't. And that's what Dogen is saying, there's a tipping point when you actually forget the self. You, you are the mirror right now, right here, right now. It's not, a, 
It's not that Dogen is saying we shouldn't study and learn things, but that's secondary to the teaching of enlightenment. And Dogen is talking about enlightenment here. He's not, he's not, he's not a fuzzy thinker. And he's talking about contrasts. Uh, he's talking about a dialectic, essentially, I think, that you, we, we, we have a, an experience of something that unifies and then we pull it apart and then we have to build something up again. And life is kind of, we're stepping off from one experience to the next. And what Dogen means by the tipping point is that uh, until you are forgetting the self, you're not mirroring the Dharma. The mirror doesn't work. But once you forget the self and you are self-effacing and humble and you begin to really uh, experience what is true, which is the Dharma, without your projection, without any of your, uh, without appropriating it for any of your agenda, then that's the tipping point where you have, we speak of Kenjo or Satori, that's what that means, if you have that uh, radical experience of, of seeing the world as perfect and sacred uh, and it had nothing to do with my ego. And that's, that tipping point happens instantly. It doesn't happen gradually. Now, we can talk about other aspects of practice with character development and having integrity and all the things we often talk about, which are processes, but enlightenment is not. I mean, it seems like a nice edge almost. Yeah, yeah. It's either a mirror or it isn't. Chris? Does he speak about it as being um, what, once that tipping point has happened, that's it? Or no. is this, is this no. sort no. of a uh, <laughs> come and go? No, good. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, it, we're not going to have time. To, I, I, wanna, I would like to go into the lines, line by line, but we'll get lost if we, if we go there. But if you read the first four lines, of, let me just read them out loud and then I'll say something. Uh, Dogen is uh, completely realistic here. He's not, I, he's not talking about an ideal of enlightenment. He's talking about the actual living transmission of the Dharma. And it's a living thing. It's not a, it's not a philosophy or a concept. So the first line that starts here, and I'm using David uh, Brazier's translation. It's not as poetic as some translations, but what it loses in poetry, it gains in clarity. So, birth and death, practice and daily life, delusion and enlightenment, ordinary beings and all Buddhas, such as the Buddha dhar Buddha's Dharma of all Dharmas. Here, you see, Dogen often starts out, he almost always starts out with, with a contrast. And here, he, and he usually starts by talking about something we're familiar with. But here he's talking about the Buddhist teachings. There are Buddhist teachings about Four Noble two Truths and uh, Five Skandhas and all that. And we are looking at those teachings from the outside and appreciating them. And that's kind of, we might say, the Yang's being in the Yang side, looking at it from the outside. And then, the second line is going to be talking about these Buddhist teachings now from the inside when you experience them for yourself and it's no longer just a text that you're reading that's outside of yourself. As the myriad dharmas are other than self, when one is in their midst, there is no creating and destroying, no sentient beings and all Buddhas, no delusion and enlightenment. So now he's saying when you're on the inside, all those dualities disappear. Enlightenment, delusion, Buddhas, ordinary beings, whatever. So he's now talking about uh, experiencing the teachings for yourself, not, not as an outsider or as a guest. Now he does a third line where he's going to bring line one and two together <coughs> and unify them in what he calls the Buddha Tao. Out of abundance and lack springs forth the original Tao of Buddha. We, that's almost always translated as way, but you miss the whole sense of this text when you translate Tao as way. It, out, of a, out of abundance and lack springs forth the original Tao of Buddha, and for this there is making and destroying, delusion and enlightenment, and there are living Buddhas. So now he's talking about 
when you really that mirror and you're reflecting the Buddha Dharma, there is no self here, and we the world is sacred through and through. And it's true. It's true because it's not, it's not, it can't be destroyed. I don't, I can't destroy it, I can't create it, I have no control over it. I can't manipulate it. That's why the Dharma is true and the most sacred word of Buddhism. But he doesn't stop here. He's got the fourth line here, which is uh, now you're starting to get really excited because you've been the possibility of waking up and having Kencho, and then he just throws cold water on your party. <laughs> just being really realistic here, he says, So it is, and nevertheless, blossoms fall bittersweet, and weeds spread amidst woeful resignation. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. <laughs> the, you just woke up and had this wonderful satori, and now the next, now it's sort of fading, and you're feeling kind of depressed. That's that's life. That's the Buddha Dharma. Mm -hmm. There is no. You wake up, and you, there is no ideal here that waking up is going to solve all your suffering. That's not Buddha. That's not how I read Dogen. Um, there is. It, and there's certainly the ideal, the notion that uh, enlightenment will say, will um, solve all your problems. <laughs> you know, I don't think so. <laughs> You're still going to have problems. You're still going to have family members and neighbors, and, uh, and you're still going to have to deal with a country that's insane <laughs> that you live in. A wonderful country. I don't want to get into politics, but you're going to have problems. So. This fourth line, he's saying, yes, even though you've had this kencho, even though you've seen clearly what is here, and you, you've had this enlightenment experience, you've been liberated from samsara, nevertheless, you are still going to uh, be subject to impermanence, and your body is going to get old, and you're going to get sick. You might get the flu or the measles or whatever, and you're going to suffer. Any questions about this? Did, did that answer your question, Chris? Um. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so when you just said it sounded like yes, um, you know, the, you still have suffering, but once you've uh, had this potential experience, you, you will sort of stay in this place of being able to see the world as sacred. And, no, it'll come okay. and go. Okay. It'll come and go. It'll yeah. come and go. It won't be, no, it's not permanent. You're not always awake and seeing everything clearly. You've had, but you don't return to delusion in the no. same way. Yeah. Once you mm -hmm. have it, there, it is a, a life changing experience. It reorients how you see the world. And maybe I should then say something a little bit about Genjo Cohen, what he means by Genjo Cohen. And uh, we could talk about this for a long time. But uh, Gensho uh, means to appear or show up or what has appeared or what's been actualized or realized or made manifest, okay? So, um, <coughs> so he's referring to a spiritual awakening, clearly, in Gensho, or the object to which one awakens. And the word koan, in our tradition, it usually means um, a conundrum, a spiritual problem. Uh, to, to speak of it most clearly, I think we could say a koan is an existential dilemma or a deep angst that we is inherent in being a mortal human being. We have to deal with life and death. And the koan is the way we begin to grapple with that existential dilemma. I'm speaking about it broadly, but then uh, koan, the, the characters for koan in Chinese roughly mean a public case, kind of like a judicial case that goes before the court. But Dogen is not using those characters for koan here. He's using different characters. And Dogen doesn't do anything by accident. He's very precise about words. He doesn't use a word haphazardly. So he had to have a reason for using different characters. And the characters he's using for it mean 
To keep one's lot or place, ko refers to equality or balance, but it's not the same character that we are familiar with. And uh, so what he's, now he's bringing in a Confucian uh, element here. And the Confucian uh, principle is called Li, which means uh, from the Confucian point of view, the most important thing is to perform rites correctly so that heaven and earth remain in balance. And Dogen uses this to talk about When he says Genjo Koen, the Koen is in whatever circumstance you are in, taking your place there and accepting that situation and working with it concretely, whatever your situation is. And that could end up being a ritual because much of our life actually is ritual. But let's not go there for now. Let's just go this notion of, of doing your duty. <coughs> and doing what you have to do. You have a family member that's sick, and you have to take care of them, because that's what you do. You don't forget about the family member. You go take, your dog is sick, you take the dog to the vet. You don't just go out and party. So Dogen's talking about something that may be not very popular in our culture. We're, we really emphasize yang stuff, and we emphasize freedom of choice, being able to choose whatever you're going to shop for on Amazon. And that seems important to us, but uh, in a Confucian culture, that totally has no bearing at all, because what's important is how you behave and how you take your place in whatever situation you're in. Does that make sense? Am I, this is kind of foreign to us, but the idea of, Doing your duty is not something we are very fond of talking about in this culture, but that in Confucian culture, that's really important. And it's important to go to what, what Dogen is saying in Genjo Koan is when you do Koan, when you are in the circumstance of your life fully, wholeheartedly, then Genjo appears. Buddhist, so Dogen starts out at the beginning of Genjo Cohen talking about the Buddha Tao, and at the end he's talking about the Tao Li. When that whole thing about the fan at the end, if we had time we could go into it, but essentially the, I hate to, sh to short circuit this stuff and not <laughs> do it thoroughly, so I think I just won't talk about it yet unless we have time, and we're, we're going to run out of time. It's hard to talk about this text in an hour. It just doesn't do it justice. So, yeah. so am I right um, that the first four lines and then what comes right? The first four lines are the like the first noble truth, uh -huh. and then right after that is the second noble truth. But after that, then he lets go and doesn't really deal with the third and fourth noble truth. As I'm looking at this now, mm -hmm. is that right? Uh, well, I don't think that he's talking about the Four Noble Truths necessarily because uh, the Buddha didn't get enlightened by practicing the Eightfold Path. He got no, enlightened by being enlightened. Right. But he also said that it is. Dogen said that No, so. no, no. The Buddha said that if you want to, this is the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't think that's, uh, again, if you, I think the, the, the first, Again, David wrote a book about the Four Noble Truths where he talked about Sangudaya is often the Second Noble Truth is often interpreted as meaning it's the cause of suffering. But what David is saying is Sangudaya is your response to suffering. So again, if you take the Four Noble Truths in a traditional sense, there's a kind of ideal, it sounds like an ideal. Practice these Four Noble Truths and uh, see the cause of suffering, which is clinging, and then practice the Eightfold Path, and it sounds like, okay, everything's going to be wonderful now. It sounds like an ideal. And I don't think that's exactly what Dogen is teaching, although I'm, I'm sorry I can't answer your question more specifically in terms of each line. Um, and we would have to, yeah. we could inquire into that, and it would be an interesting discussion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
So uh, notice that uh, there are contrasts. Uh, you know, Dokken doesn't talk about non-duality like we do. And that's why, again, I think this is a very Taoist text. He's talking about a dynamic dialectic between this and that, and how this becomes that, and then that becomes a springboard for something else. So we have the koan in our tradition, what, how are you, you going to do when you, how are you going to jump off the 100-foot flagpole? Well, first you have to climb up the pole. That's the first part of the dialectic. You can't, you're not at the top of the pole, you first have to get there. And then when you're at the top of the pole and you clarify things, what are you going to do next? That's the next dialectic. You're going to have to do something. And what Dogen is saying is when we are that mirror and we realize Genjo, then we have a response to engage in the world, which becomes a bodhisattva path. You have to do something. You're using the fan, like the master is at the end. He's not talking about some philosophy about absolute and relative or something. He's using it. We, you have to, there's, and Dogen is very clear about this. He's saying this is not an abstract teaching or a philosophy. This is a living transmission. And it's transmitted in relationship, in relationships. It's not your enlightenment. It's not your Buddha Dharma. It's, it's a relational <coughs> Uh, dialectic that's dynamic. So all of the teachings are transmitted in our tradition from teacher to student. They're di you don't get the get it by yourself. You get it by being in relationship to a teacher. Uh, I mean that's that's how our tradition works. And so Dogen is saying that um, Satori and enlightenment includes this Confucian idea of Li, which is you have to you then have a response to, do, you, you have to do something. It's not a passive thing. You actually become engaged in some way with your community, your sangha, the world, your family. You, and, and then the question is, how do you know someone's enlightened? And you really don't necessarily know. The person that's enlightened may not know they're enlightened. You can easily, in fact, it's very likely that you could be a Buddha and not even know you're the Buddha. Much more likely. If you think you're the Buddha, you probably are. It's <laughs> <laughs> probably still appropriate. We're all the Buddha. Well, if, if you meet the Buddha, you're supposed to kill him. That's yeah, right. right. Exactly. Do that, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're a sacrilegious tradition. <laughs> What tradition says kill their founder? <laughs> so, now the point here is that, um, what was the point? <laughs> <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> uh, I had a point there, but uh, I got distracted. It might come back. Who knows? Come back. You said that um, we might not even know. Yeah. If we're enlightened, you yeah. kind of left from there. I, there's something before that point. That I, engaging with the world. And, hmm? Engaging with the world. And yeah, it's, it's, it's gone. I think it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> that Dogen really isn't so clear. <laughs> huh? That Dogen really isn't so clear. No, I think he's actually crystal clear. Oh, yeah, but we're not getting it. I think we can. I think it's possible. I think he's talking about, oh, the thing I wanted to talk about is that he, he's using uh, opposites and pairs all the time. Fish and birds, Buddhas and uh, enlightenment and delusion, uh, uh, shore and the boat. All these uh, are, are code, uh, fire, firewood and ash. Uh, the, the passage about firewood and ash has always puzzled me. And I pretended like I knew what it meant. It had something to do with time or being present, which is what a lot of the translations of the text suggest. But uh, what David says is he, he believes that. Uh, I don't think Dogen was particularly interested in the metaphor of firewood and ash. He was using code words. And he was, firewood is a code word for our, our fiery nature, our passionate nature that stirs things up and gets upset and creates trouble. And ash is when, so firewood is a, is a code word for delusion. And ash is a code word for, wait for it, enlightenment. <laughs> enlightenment. 
That's just the opposite of how we would like to see it in our culture. We mm -hmm. want life and the fire and the passion. That's how we, but ash and death is what's preferred. <laughs> that doesn't appeal to us, you know? But that's what Dog is saying, is the ash is actually the fertile, and it's the yin side. And the, the firewood is definitely the yang side. And he's using these contrasts all the time throughout his teaching. And he, he uses separation, too. He separates out. So he's building it. That's what I mean. He's not a fuzzy thinker in any way whatsoever. So he starts to build his argument at the beginning. So in line five, he says, how deluded to think oneself a teacher of the myriad dharmas. How deluded to think that I would be sitting up here teaching you anything about the Buddha Dharma. I'm deluded. When myriad dharmas come, faith for to train and enlighten the self, that is enlightenment. All Buddhists are greatly enlightening delusion. Those who are greatly deluded about enlightenment are ordinary beings. He's building his argument here. So people who are enlightened are continually being enlightened within enlightenment. He's now making a really sharp contrast between enlightenment and delusion. He's not mixing, he's not fuzzy here at all. He's saying, there, if you're deluded, then you continue being deluded. And if you're enlightened, you, can, you, you continue being enlightened. He's not saying they're the same now. There's delusion and there's enlightenment. He's, he's not fuzzy thinking at all. This is very rigorous uh, dialectic. He's like Hegel. Uh, it's just amazing. Those in the middle of delusion get more deluded. When all Buddhas really are all Buddhas, the self does not need to know all Buddhas. Not knowing. Uh, we have a tendency to think that spiritual practice is about being real, overly, really conscious and understanding everything. That's not so important in Buddhism. But Buddhism is more about emptiness than fullness. And it's more about the, the heart than it is about and getting something in your bones in your, than it is about what you understand. Yes, study and understanding is not unimportant, but it's secondary to the, the main event. And what's the main event? Liberation. And if we don't, you know, that's why this is a religious text through and through. And I, I'm sorry to say it because I know in our culture we're, and we build a whole Zen center, we never talk about religion. But if you take Durkheim's definition of religion, it's religious consciousness is being able to make a distinction between what's mundane and what's sacred. And if you can't do that, then how can you have enlightenment? So you, if you don't have enlightenment, you just have a humanistic psychology, or you have mindfulness. But that's not what we're teaching here. We're teaching mindfulness in the context of a genuine, authentic, uh, spiritual path of awakening, aren't we? And uh, he's not apologizing. He's not being uh, he's very clear, it seems to me, about enlightenment. He's saying that's the that's the point, is to wake up. And that's a, it's hard to imagine, uh, it's not so much you do it by your will, you do it by letting go. By forget, forgetting the self is, is really about dropping off on your mind, it means to really let go of what I, all my stuff, my agenda, my desires, my, uh, the way I want to be a great Zen teacher or a great whatever. It's just, it's just all spiritual materialism. It's not the, the authentic path of enlightenment. So it's hard to not, it's hard to read this and not see that there is an element of religion here which is it's not my will but thy will be done. There's a, there's a kind of letting go of my my consciousness, which wants to understand everything, wants to nail everything down, and there's a, really, Dogen is talking about faith. <laughs> He's talking about faith that is uh, supported by rigorous, rigorous practice. Both. To have faith in the Buddha Dharma. 
Now, another teaching that was common at the time was self-power and other power. And the idea is in Zen is self-power. You enlighten by, by yourself. You enlighten by acquiring and, and learning by yourself. And uh, so Zen was known as self-power. And then the Pure Lab School was known as other power. And Honen, who was the founder of the Pure Lab School, felt that, you know, Buddhism was too hard for lay people, that no one was going to actually practice that rigorously. So he developed this practice where people could chant the name of Ami, they could chant the name of Amitabha Buddha. And he said anyone could do that. And so this became known as other power. And the idea was that you, the Buddhas aren't in me. I don't possess the Buddha. The Buddhas are actually, if you read the Lotus Sutra, it's deeply, again, deeply religious. It's talking about cosmic Buddhas are everywhere. And they can help us. Do we want their help? Yes. <laughs> do we? I think we tend to want to do everything ourselves, don't we? I kind of want to do it my way. The idea that I would, that the Buddhists are out there to help me, it's not a very Zen notion. And yet, that's, and I don't think uh, Dogen is coming down on one side or the other. Uh, it, there's a phrase in here later on where he's, he's acknowledging that both are, are, are part of practice, other power and, and self power. But I think for our culture, it might be useful to appreciate the other power side of the equation because I think we're generally keen to be self-sufficient and figure things out for ourselves. And the idea of surrendering and having faith in something outside of myself, that's a religious notion that not very, we're not very keen on that in this culture. So, but the Lotus Sutra is full of examples. Uh, you read any of the sutras, there's, a, there's hundreds of Buddhas out there waiting to help, help us cross over to the other shore. Not, again, this is not something that is easy to, so I think part of the problem of, of being, understanding the Genjo Kon is we're, we're having to put <coughs> ourselves in the mindset of the 13th century monastic who was deeply religious, and it's just not our culture, so we have to take a kind of leap to, I'm not suggesting that we we practice like Dogen. I don't think I want to. He was way too ascetic for me. I, don't know. I like painting and doing other things. Uh, but I am suggesting that this is a deeply, uh, uh, profoundly uh, uh, spiritual text that is one cloth all the way through. Essentially, Dogen is saying, forget yourself, be humble, be self-effacing, be modest, practice the precepts, um, practice sazen, practice meditation, uh, don't be complacent. He warns in the text about if you think you understand the Dharma, then you probably don't. And if you if you if you really get the Buddha the Dharma in your bones, then something is still missing. He's saying, don't be complacent. Don't think you've arrived at some place where there's no more work to be done. Wherever you arrived is just a jumping off place for the next play thing that you need to do. And so it's dynamic. That's what I mean about the dialectic of Taoism. It's a, it's a, you know, the Taoist circle. It's a, the yin and the yang, it's, a, it's, a, it's always moving, it's a, and it's in balance or it's not. And so Dogen is saying uh, that this aspect, the, the, these contrasts of yin and yang are uh, part of what life is. Uh, our human experience is how we are experiencing these contrasts all the time, the, and we're going from one to the next. I don't know if I'm being very clear about this, but um, any questions? I'm, I, feel, I just feel totally inadequate to actually be speaking about this text this morning. I'm, it is so rich. I'm, I'm seeing a course. Mm -hmm. huh? I'm seeing a course. Uh, <laughs> course. This is fascinating. Yeah. It's, really, it's really very yeah. interesting. Mark? The, um, the yin and the yang has 
just that you know, they're opposites, but then they also contain the opposite in the other one, right? Mm -hmm. So how does that fit now, which, what you're saying? Does it or does it relate or not? Well, the idea, the basic idea of Taoism is if you go all the way on the inside, you'll flip over to the, the yang side. And if you go all the way to the yang side, you'll flip over to the yin side. I got you. So there's a passage later on where Dogen is talking about, you know, if you're a fish, just be a fish and swim in the water that you're in. If you're a bird, fly in the air and be a bird. Again, he's using contrast. You could say the bird is the is the is above the water and the fish is down under the water. So he's also using these metaphors constantly throughout the Genjo Koan and he's saying the same thing over and over and over again. That be on the inside, forget the self, and no and appreciate what is other than you. You to really appreciate what is other than me, I have to let go of myself because I'm always getting in the way. I'm always projecting. I'm always polluting that, so to speak, with my own agenda. And Dogen is saying you've got to get out of the way in order to see the sacred nature of the Buddha Dharma. And he said very clearly the Dharma is whatever is other than you. So we're fond of thinking of Buddha nature, and we've taught, I've taught this most of my life, that we all have Buddha nature and basic sanity goodness. It's not a bad teaching, but it's probably not very accurate in terms of it. If we were appreciating it from the point of view of the Genjo Cohen, uh, I think Dogen would consider that to be pretty narcissistic and not accurate. Because there's a, when you do it that way, you're, you, there's almost I'm not going to say always, but pretty likely that we're going to appropriate that for our own ends. I mean, we just have to appreciate how, how slippery the ego is and how easy it is to fool ourselves. We can get so sincere, I'm doing a Zen practice, you know, and, and you tell your friend and they just say, oh, you're doing Zen. <laughs> the surface with this text. It, yeah, I, it, like a like a koan, you could you can you can get something out of this uh, probably for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I highly recommend that you we're gonna do a study group with uh, this book and I, I think David has really he's brilliant and I think he's done something really important that hasn't been done so far in his translation. And I think the key is that he actually uh, appreciates the Chinese element of Dogen's thought, and I don't see it in any of, I haven't found it in any of the other translations. And when you miss that Chinese element, you miss a major piece of what Dogen is saying here. Any more yeah. questions? Okay, yeah, Keisha. Um, okay, so about this mirror. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. and reflection. Mm -hmm. How important how important is the reflection? And to whom is that mirror reflecting? Uh, I mean, what's that <laughs> relationship? It is a relationship. It's a relationship. The mirror is a reflecting to the other. The other is seeing, seeing the Let's put it, let's do, use another analogy. You're in your room, and, you, and there's a window in your room, and someone is looking into your room. And if you have a light on bright in your room, which we just say is the self, and we're fascinated with ourselves, then the person will be able to see you in the room, but they won't see any reflection. And uh, kind of like Narcissus looking at his own reflection, you, you'll you see the mirror reflected back at you, which will be great because you're looking at yourself, but it's not the mirror yet. So the only way that window becomes a mirror is if you turn your light down enough so that now the light outside of the sun and the moon is exactly far greater than our light. 
that we have in our own little room, it's far greater and more important. Then that light begins to shine and, and that window that the person could see you through, now they see the reflection and they see it didn't become the mirror. And what they see is themselves or that body. Yeah, but they might also see the sun and the moon or, they might, or, a car going, or a car going by or whatever, the myriad things, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. myriad dharmas. Myriad yeah. means, uh, let me, one more point on that. Uh, myriad uh, means 100,000, 100, but there's also a term in Sanskrit, lakh, which also means 100,000, and it's an important concept in Buddhism, it's laksana, and laksana means what something is pointing towards. So the idea here is that we all, we, I don't know about you, but I have all my paintings upstairs and they all reflect me because I painted them. And most of us have things in our house that reflect us. And so this notion of Laksana is we, we all are pointing, we have things that point towards our own self-identity in our house. But the idea is that actually you want to have Laksana that points towards the Buddha Dharma a Buddha statue or something that you didn't make, that it's not yours. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So again, the, the idea over and over here is to be humble and self-effacing and uh, kind, um, practice. It's really important to, although, interestingly enough, Dogen doesn't mention Zazen at all in the Gendo poem. And we know that he, he was a firm believer in a rigorous meditation practice. And, and in fact, in all of the Shobo Genzo, he doesn't talk a lot of, why wouldn't he talk about Zazen in, in the Genzo poem? Maybe he just assumed that the person he was writing to already had that practice, so he didn't need to say it. But he doesn't talk about Zazen a lot in the Shobo Genzo. Tuka, Tuka Gazenzi, he speaks about it very specifically, but he doesn't hear. But no. Yeah, the Mendoza, but other than that, not much. So that's that's interesting. But we've run out of time, and I thank you so much for coming. And um, do have a good holiday season this December with your family and community, and take care of each other uh, as we move through kind of turbulent times as a country. Let's, let's be kind and and. Notice that Sangha is good. Sangha is good because it's a community of people that are seeing this sacred world, and the sacred world is true. So Sangha is people that are making an effort to see what is true. Mm -hmm.